Fed gave markets everything they wanted, and they still did not applaud it. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. Just in the wake of what was uh, a very action-packed Fed monetary policy announcement, the Fed seemingly bringing for the markets all of the dovishness they could have asked for. They wanted more cuts this year. The Fed's got them. 50 basis point cut. The outlook matching the market's expectations for two more cuts this year. The outlook for next year pretty much in line with market expect, uh, expectations, envisioning another 100 basis points next year with ample time to dial that up a little bit to the market's slightly more dovish disposition. The guidance from the Fed, everything that uh, markets might have baked in ahead of the announcement. Stocks rally, then drop. The dollar sells off and surges, and we're left with a little bit, bit of a stronger dollar, a little bit of a weaker gold, a little bit of a weaker setting on stock markets, because it's a buy the rumor, sell the fact kind of day. And yet we are not done with interest rates yet. Because from here, that continues to be the story just across the Atlantic. Now that the Fed has given us a baseline and put us on something of an autopilot setting through the end of the year, or at least until they update their projections again in December, we have an opportunity for the markets to begin to take this new baseline and apply it across markets in reaction to everything else that's going on. And the very next thing to happen keeps us in interest rate land as the Bank of England gets ready to deliver its monetary policy announcement. And of course, this not only has relevance for the UK, though surely it has relevance there, but it likewise speaks to more generally how markets might interpret this new world where the Fed, having been the object of speculation for the better part of a year, has stepped back by saying to markets, you've been anticipating rate cuts since November of 2023. Here they are. And not only are they here in line with what you wanted, the outlook for how many of them there will be from now and through the end of next year is all but completely in line with what you wanted. Are you not entertained? And the market said, mm, what have you done for me lately? It is against this backdrop that we now look at how the breadth of assets, be they currencies, be they stocks, be they commodities, be they metals, how they are going to behave after so much speculation has been taken out of the macro landscape. And it's the Bank of England that is going to test this first. Now, for their part, we are not expecting to see a rate cut after they began cutting rates last month. So we've already had the move down here from five and a quarter to five percent. We can see back in June, still at five and a quarter for bank rate. By the time we get to August, this is uh, literally August 1st that this occurs, right at the start of the month, we shift down. So there's the one cut. The way forward here, seemingly implying no, uh, no action in September, we can see benchmark Sonia futures looking at only a six basis point uh, change between bank rate and what is likely this month. So nothing there. But once we look at the remainder of the year, we see a cut is all but fully baked in for November, and we're leaning in the direction of another cut when we look at December. So uh, if we see here uh, the implication at 4.58, 
we're just eight basis points on the wrong end of another rate cut, or we've baked in about 17 out of 25 basis points in that second rate cut into the market. So that second cut carries a likelihood of 68%. In other words, the Fed is uh, out of the way. Now these central banks can pave their own uh, way forward here. And for the Bank of England, that looks like a pause here and two cuts to follow, November and December. We can see what that looks like here. And uh, the tally of 42 basis points. Now, leading into this, we had a bit of CPI data that might encourage the Bank of England to hold fire this time. Uh, here's that outcome there. Uh, and we come in exactly in line with expectations on the headline 2.2% year on year. That's unchanged from the prior month and certainly doesn't uh, raise any red flags. But the core reading, the one that the Bank of England cares most about, for obvious reasons, that's where they have the most agency. No central bank can really push around global uh, food, energy uh, costs and uh, do that within sort of their remit of policy and have direct influence. And so, of course, the Bank of England is focused on those things which it can do. And that's core inflation, mainly driven by the domestic economy. And here you get a little bit of a spook, 3.6% percent expected versus 3.5. Now, the markets already had the expectation that we were going to go up on core inflation here. And indeed, this was going to be the first increase in some years. Nevertheless, this is a bit of an increase uh, surprise. This is a bit larger than what the markets had in scope. So the idea that the Bank of England might well hold off at this meeting, that seems well supported. The question, though, is what does this mean going forward? And of course, then is putting the spotlight on the guidance that the Bank of England is going to give us. And of course, how that guidance fits into the larger narrative. In fact, the reason we've all been so focused on these central banks is because it seems like the global growth story is in a troubling spot. Europe is struggling to find its way to sustained growth. It's recovered a bit from uh, the inflation-like conditions late last year, but growth isn't exactly screaming. China is anemic. And everyone's hope basically rests on the Fed getting right the calculus for the U.S., because if the U.S. economy were to turn, then a global recession seems almost inescapable. And so now that the Fed has had its say, what these other central banks are going to do and how they're going to manage their house now to uh, attempt to avoid this adverse outcome becomes not only a referendum on what happens in the UK economy or this economy or that economy, but what the entire macro landscape starts to look like and what all the puzzle pieces are going to fit like now that we've sort of reshuffled the board. So this is where things get interesting. If we look at the details of the CPI report, we find that as with a lot of developed economies, it's services inflation that's the, the issue. You can see that's this uh, darker uh, reddish line here. And you can see even just anecdotally how much of a difference there is between the decline in goods inflation, which spiked a lot and then came down a lot, and services, which didn't spike as high, but also hasn't come down very much. As a matter of fact, it's only down about 1.8 percentage points off the peak, 
whereas overall inflation is down from 11% at the peak down now to 2.2. Uh, so, uh, and of course, goods inflation at this point is actually negative. So we're looking at uh, a situation here then that's, uh, again, sticky and struggling to keep pace with overall disinflation, which might give the Bank of England some cause for pause. Uh, if we look at where that uh, inflation comes from, it continues to be stuck in these pockets here, recreation and hospitality. They are still the biggest overall contributors to inflation in August. Uh, and of course, the question is, well, what would it take to get them down? What's interesting, though, is that none of this really changes the Bank of England's bias. And this is perhaps the most instructive part of what may happen next. While recreation and hospitality are the largest overall contributors, the changes in those contributions in August tell a much more encouraging story. Hospitality actually is the biggest loser. Its move down month to month is the biggest. So we can see here, here's hospitality. It was a larger contributor in July. It is a smaller contributor in um, August. And the change from here to here is actually the largest among the various components. The Recreation side of things is still a little bit chipper. And here uh, you start to have a conversation about is the economy slowing enough? Are you having enough weakness in uh, the uh, economic cycle to deflate spending in what is generally a discretionary kind of category? But then you start to wonder, well, why is inflation here so sticky? And the message seems to mainly rest with wages, M much as it did in the U.S., and much as it continues to be the case in the U.S., locking in high wages during the uh, hiring spree immediately after COVID, that seems to be how we have all this sticky inflation still uh, sitting in the service sector. And we'll get to the jump in the transport component here, which of course is directly on the screen in just a second. It is certainly helpful for the larger story then to consider that for the past two months, the UK economy has not grown. It is plainly at standstill. We, and these are uh, June and July, as ever, with, uh, with uh, GDP, even on a monthly number, you're still somewhat lagged. Wages are actually trending in the way that the Bank of England would want them to, as a matter of fact, uh, down to 4% in July, year on year, uh, amounts to the slowest pace of wage growth since November of 2020. So it does seem like the pressure points are still unwinding. So what's going on here? Well, one of the interesting bits in this inflation report is that apparently a lot of the service sector stickiness, at least this month, owed to one-off factors. There was a big jump in airfare costs, the second largest jump, as a matter of fact, on record. And that looks like a one-off. That doesn't seem like something that you're likely to see ongoing, in particular as uh, crude oil is uh, closer to its lows, not its highs. So there is uh, a pathway here that, seems to favor continued disinflation, and that doesn't seem to scream like these CPI numbers are something that should mark 
a head change for the Bank of England. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at what markets are baking in beyond these next several meetings, we can look at overnight index swaps here. And not surprisingly, we can see the three-month rate is above the six-month, which is above the 12-month. So there is a steady path toward easing that the markets envision from now and over the course of one year forward. Moreover, uh, we can see that the pace of easing accelerates. So if we look at where we're sitting here on these spreads between 12, 6, and 3-month overnight index uh, swaps and the 1-month, so in other words, where are we going to go over the course of a quarter from now, a half year from now, or a year from now, what we find is uh, that over the three-month range, it's a change of 31 basis points. Over six months, it's 80. Over 12 months, it's 140. So as we look at all of this, we clearly have quite the easing cycle still on the cards. Now, the Bank of England might well opt to hold fire this time. If we look at where more high-frequency measures of, of growth are sitting, there's certainly a bit of a pickup in economic activity here in August. You can see a, a slight acceleration in composite PMI, largely helped along by a rebound in the service sector. Uh, we're going to get an update on this next week, and the expectation is actually that we are going to get uh, a further pickup in, in, in services. We'll see if manufacturing offsets that to a more significant uh, extent. But it does look like there is a bit of vigor in the economy. Uh, the UK, in fact, one of the few major economies where manufacturing has climbed out of contraction territory, below 50 on this uh, PMI index, where above 50 is expansion and below 50 is contraction. And so perhaps there isn't urgency to cut this time. But the Bank of England almost certainly wants the markets to onboard the idea that this is not a reason to panic, that they will get more easy, that inflation is trending in the correct direction, and that the spook on CPI here is not a function of lasting factors that take the central bank off course. So even as we perhaps might hold off on a cut this time, that much seems in line with expectations as we've just seen them here, the Bank of England might have reason to, through its rhetoric, to, through the minutes from the meeting, through the, uh, uh, the press conference with Governor Bailey, signal that the bias remains dovish and more cutting is afoot. Now, that might shift us from 42 to 50 basis points and mark something of a dovish uh, adjustment in the outlook. It may also shift this calculus to a still more dovish setting. We can see it's become increasingly dovish since uh, about mid-year, and we can see that more and more of the easing has been uh, set up over the longer end of this um, of this story, but nevertheless, if we're going to hold off here, it would be likely that the Bank of England wants to say that this does not mark a change of tack, just a pause, to make sure that inflation doesn't jump away from where the uh, the trend that the Bank of England wants to sustain is leading. And so with that in mind, the risk here may well be on the downside for the British pound, which popped a little bit after the CPI data yesterday. Now, where this fits within the broader story is, of course, the pound is one of the more interesting spots for markets today where 
the dollar spiked lower on this dovish Fed, but then could not sustain it. And so one of the places where the dollar has done least well is indeed the pound. Moreover, one of the markets that have been the most resilient in the face of the Fed-driven volatility has been the pound. So to put this in context, uh, the Aussie dollar, basically uh, a flat reading on the day. The euro, basically a flat reading on the day. Uh, the yen, down just a touch, but basically a flat reading on the day. The pound, up about four-tenths of a percent in the wake of that CPI data setting up for now a Bank of England that follows a dovish Fed and is not expected to cut, at least this time. Well, if the rhetoric that they come with meaningfully changes that calculus and says, no, actually, the dollar couldn't sell off on a dovish Fed, and now the Bank of England is doing everything it can to signal, no, no, there's more cuts coming, just not here and not now, but there is a lot more easing that's on the horizon and seeks to reassure markets that way, then one of the more opportune setups in the wake of all of this might well be a view on dollar gains against the pound. It will also, of course, be an interesting test of how the Bank of England decides to onboard what the Fed has said, because clearly the Fed is the arbiter of global borrowing costs because the dollar is the premier global currency of commerce and the cost of borrowing dollars is the cost of borrowing, full stop. So if the Bank of England opts not to dilute its pause, not to dial up dovish rhetoric, and instead seems to be letting the Fed do the heavy lifting, and that were already not impressive for stock markets or the dollar, well, then the response might not just be stuck in currency markets. If it looks like what the Fed has done today could be giving central banks outside of the U.S. leeway to cut less by way of saying, oh, just let the Fed do the heavy lifting and keep some of your own ammunition ready to go for later, that might well register as risk off for markets in a broader sense, because they are indeed concerned about some sort of a global slowdown maybe getting out of hand. And that wouldn't just be a pound move, that may well extend to stocks, bonds, gold, which also uh, was unable to rally to, uh, today, and a whole host of other assets. And that is macro money for today, as ever. Uh, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan, looking at the Wall Street uh, close and uh, co-host with Chris Vecchio, of course, as well, uh, looking at the Wall Street close and what that might mean going forward. Uh, I am on with uh, the great and powerful Victor Jones later to today for the price of truth. It'll be a special post-Fed episode with the legendary Ira Harris in tow, so definitely come check that out. That's just 30 minutes from now. Uh, I'll be back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour Friday, back with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See you in 30 minutes.